Welcome, my name is Colonel Hugh Reed. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about a how to add 10 plus points to your multi-state bar exam score. You see, the multi-state bar exam is the most important part of the exam you're about to take. Even those states that say that half, half of the questions or half of the score will count, count towards your total score to pass the bar exam. If you do not get an average or above score on the multi-state, you have very little chance of passing the bar exam. Now, I'm just not talking about the multi-state uh, in some intellectual way um, or some conceptual way. I just got back from taking my 30, 30th multi-state bar exam. So I know a little bit about this process. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is 10 steps, 10 things you can do to score a high on the multi-state bar exam and therefore pass your entire bar exam. So uh, 10 things, uh, let me outline them for you and then I'll talk about them individually. Number one, read carefully. Doesn't sound like much, but it's important. Number two, read the call of the question first, the interrogatory of the question. Number three, do not look for a correct answer, but instead eliminate answer choices that cannot possibly correct, be correct. Number four, test each answer choice using an analysis of factual accuracy, legal accuracy, and finally, analytical accuracy. Number five, stick to the basics. The majority views do not get hung up on minority views. Number six, be, be aware of terms of art, terms of art. Number seven, do not become emotionally involved in this examination. Number eight, if you get an off-the-wall question, and by the way, there have been a lot of them recently, don't panic. <coughs> Excuse me. Think general terms. Number nine, time management. Keep moving at a steady pace. And number ten, status quo. Status quo, whatever has gotten you here, uh, keep doing it. Don't change anything. All right. So let's talk about uh, each of these individually. The first um, is um, to read carefully. The first rule is to read carefully. Now, I prefer an active reading. That is, I circle um, facts. I, certain, I certainly uh, focus on statutes they give me, and I certainly focus on things that are in quotation marks. The new changes on the multi-state bar exam um, are that all the questions are now dichotomy questions. That is, two answer choices holding one way, two answer choices holding uh, the other. And then, of course, the rationale for the yeses and the noes. So reading carefully is important. Do not assume facts on this examination. I'm talking particularly to you, uh, to those of you who, uh, uh, who are out there thinking, well, oh great, I skipped the Super Bowl review or I skipped an important event to watch this guy tell me to read carefully. You are the people that I'm trying to reach because you get 200 questions, 100 in the morning, 100 in the afternoon, approximately 1.7 to 1.8 minutes per question. And um, some of these fact patterns are very long. In fact, all of the examinations on recent exams, um, 100 questions to about 48 pages, but sometimes up to three questions per page. So here's what's going to happen to you. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, for the multi-state bar exam. And uh, you decide you're not having any fun anymore. In fact, you're, you're uh, experiencing an etc. headache, right? And that's big. 
you're going to get sloppy. Uh, you're not reading carefully. You start reading question, and it says, you know, Jack walked into a house, the door which was wide open, picked up a purse in the front uh, hallway, and walked out. And then the question says something about a statute in that jurisdiction. And you skim over that. Then the call of the question says, if charged with burglary, Jack most likely will be found guilty, guilty, not guilty, not guilty, in rationale behind it. And you, uh, you I mean, I, some of you are going to say to yourself, well, thank God, this is the one I know because I know burglaries, the breaking and entering in the nighttime of the dwelling of another with the intent to commit a felony or larceny therein. Except the statute changes the definition of burglary. Give you an example. Arson, for example, in the common law, is the burning of the dwelling of another. Arson, modernly in most jurisdictions, is the burning of any dwelling, including your own, to collect insurance. Well, you've got to read the statute. You've got to give you uh, read the facts that they give you. And if you skim the statute, and you don't pay attention, then uh, chances are you're going to miss that question. The National Conference of Bar Examiners, the proponent of this exam, uh, their studies conclude that about five to ten questions um, on the multi-state bar exam are lost to, um, to not reading carefully. All right. So don't make those kinds of stupid mistakes. I guess that's what I'm saying. Active reading is critical. That is, circle facts, circle statutes, circle strange sounding facts, such as a pharmacist selling a lawnmower. What the hell is he selling a lawnmower for? He's a pharmacist. He should be selling drugs, right? Well, they're not wasting ink and paper here. They're telling you that the pharmacist is selling a lawnmower and perhaps there's an Article 2 or uh, the law of sales implication which is going to be tested in contracts. So read the question caref carefully. The multi-state bar exam, just like essays, give you a lot of facts and you have to sort out what's important and what's not. So avoid those silly mistakes by not reading carefully. Another example is in the law of property. Remember, under the common law, a devise uh, or a transfer of property to A and B jointly was a joint tenancy with right of survivorship. Modernly, all states want to uh, tax the transfer of property, so they've concluded in their statute, in their legislative process, that we have to have the magic language with a joint tenancy with right of survivorship, with right of survivorship. All right, well, they don't tell you whether you're in common law or modern law, so the fact, uh, you're going to have to read the fact pattern assuming that both apply and then the answer choices will tell you whether you're in common law land or whether you're in modern law land. All right, read carefully. Rule number two, focus on the call of the question. Focus on the interrogatory. Everything else, quite frankly, makes your head hurt. You focus on the call of the question first, both for multi-state and for essay purposes. You read the call of the question first. The call of the question. It's the last few lines, it's separated by a space, and it asks the question you're to answer. And in, 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 in my burglary example, for, except, uh, for example, the part that said, if charged with burglary, Jack most likely will be found. That's the call of the question. So by the time you read the fact pattern, you really should be on the side of guilty or not guilty, because two answer choices will hold guilty, two answer choices will hold not guilty. And then, of course, the rationale, therefore. So read the call of the question very carefully and focus 
your attention on whatever it asks and nothing else. So if you're plugging along and you come along a fact pattern with complex facts, talks about Jack, Jill, Bob, and Tom, and as you read through it, issues are popping out at you faster than you can keep up with them. It looks like these four people committed at least three different crimes. One of them was drunk, so the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, defense of voluntary intoxication could pop up for a specific intent crime. Don't despair. Don't give up. Because every time they do this to you, they will give you a call to the question that narrows everything down to one person and one issue. So the call of the question will give you what you're looking for, all right? Read the call of the question very carefully and focus your attention on what it asks you to do. And then eliminate answer choices. Never look for the right answer, all right? So all of these additional facts are just smoke. Uh, they're nothing important. Focus on the call of the question. Rule three, do not look for the right answer. Do not look for the right answer. Always eliminate answer choices. In fact, on this last exam, my 30th MBE, I can tell you, I often didn't know whether the answer was guilty or not guilty. It wasn't until I eliminated answer choices and the rationale that I'm left with uh, one answer choice. Right? If you're le left with two answer choices, I'll show you in a moment how to handle that. But eliminate answer choices. Do not look for the right answer because um, even though the bar examiners use repeat questions, and sometimes I say, aha! I've seen this fact pattern before. Well, last time they, uh, the call of the question dealt with negligence, this time the call of the question dealt with strict liability. So they've changed the call of the question. So do not look for the right answer. Forget about the real world. Um, so the multi-state uh, does not test your ability to pick the right answer it has very little to do with the real world. It tests your ability to eliminate answer choices and eliminate the worst answer choices. They cannot possibly be right. So in effect, even though you have 200 questions on the multi-state bar exam, 10 obviously are experimental questions out of the 200, but because you have four answer choices, it's really an 800 question true and false test. 800 question true and false question. So, uh, give you an example. You know, if they ask you, or if I were to ask you, uh, what's the capital of the United States? And you say, holy smokes, even I know that. And you go down and look for Washington, D.C. What if it's not there? Well, if it's not there, what are you going to do? Cut your wrists? Think about working with your hands for the rest of your life? No, you've got to eliminate answer choices. So let's say the answer choices are Houston, Chicago, San Francisco, um, Baltimore. Well, the best answer choices of those four has to be Baltimore. Because in the late 1700s, when Congress used to move around trying to avoid uh, being eliminated, um, Baltimore was one of the capitals, so was Philadelphia, so was New York. Um, you know, a lot of towns were capitals at that point in time. Make a long story short, do not look for the right answer. Eliminate answer choices, all right? All right, um, forget about the real world. Figure out what has to be wrong with the four answer choices on this particular uh, question and eliminate answer choices, all right? All right, um, eliminate answer choices. Rule number four, test each of the four answers with three things. Number one, factual accuracy. Number two, legal accuracy. 
And number three, um, application accuracy or analysis. So, if you if you come down to uh, you know a couple of answer choices, and what you're going to have to do is test to see whether it's factually correct. Does the answer accurately characterize the facts? Sometimes it won't. Just, just to see whether you're a careful reader. So factual accuracy is the first thing you ask yourself. Number two, does the answer accurately ref reflect uh, the law? Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will state exactly the opposite uh, of that applicable legal rule to see if you know the correct statement of the rule. And you can weed out the incorrect one. Finally, does the answer accurately apply the law to the facts and reach a technically correct conclusion? This is what it boils down to for most answer choices. Um, the uh, technically correct conclusion, that is, an answer choice that answers the question. All right? So if the answer choice doesn't answer the question, the interrogatory, well, then it's probably not the right answer. So don't jump for the buzzwords. Uh, systematically test each answer with factual, legal, and application accuracy. Buzzwords, particularly those words you've never heard before, are generally the wrong answer. So if you haven't heard the term or terminology in your bar review, it's generally the right answer. Now, uh, the problem with a lot of bar reviews is that their lecturers uh, have maybe taken one bar exam. Some lecturers who lecture nationwide for bar reviews have never taken and passed a multi-state bar exam. And that's a problem. Susan Case, the director for testing for the National Conference of Bar Examiners, she's recently retired, said that most candidates who fail the bar exam say that on the multi-state they saw questions they've never seen before in their bar review. Now I can promise you that's not going to happen in our bar review, in our training. I take the bar exam every six months and I've taken and passed it 30 times and counting, by the way. And the reason I take it is I represent servicemen and women pro bono worldwide and uh, I'd like to be licensed in as many states as I can. All right. Now, I cannot give you the exact question that's been tested, um, because that would be a copyright infringement, but I can give you the concept. So recently I tutored a, uh, a son of a good friend of mine who's a, who's a products liability lawyer, and I said, hey, Bob, have you ever heard of this terminology. He said, never heard of it. I said, well, I just saw it on the recent bar exam. And um, the terminology uh, has to do with uh, a uh, liability of pharmaceutical companies. He'd never heard of it. But that's why you need to listen to someone who, or, or uh, study with someone who's taken a lot of uh, bar exams because he or she can tell you that terminology. All right? All right, number five. Stick to the basics, the majority views. And don't worry about minority views unless the question quotes a statute or tells you a jurisdiction follows a particular view. So stick to the basics, majority view. And that, um, because it's an objective test, they have to have one answer that everybody agrees with is the best. That means they have to test the majority views unless they tell you different. So if the question does not quote a statute or tell you your jurisdiction follows a particular view, stick with the basics. On the multi-state bar exam, you can forget everything you've learned in real life. All right, Apply the national majority view. Uh, so, for insanity defenses, that's McNaughton. 
And recently they, you know, tested McNaughton. They always test McNaughton, one or two questions. And the three things they like to test on McNaughton, number one, do you know the rule? That is the two-part test. Uh, number two, do you know that the defendant has the burden of proof by preponderance of the evidence to uh, prove up that he or she was insane? And number three, um, do you know that in minority views, um, the, uh, oh, by the way, preponderance, that's the majority, uh, under U.S. statute in a couple, of, uh, a couple of states in the United States, the defendant has to prove up by clear and convincing evidence that he or she was insane. And then in the vast minority views, the vast minority, uh, or, or just a couple of states, the prosecution has to prove up every element of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, what's new, you knew that, also the fact that you were sane at the time you committed the crime by, um, by clear, uh, I'm sorry, by a, a, a beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard, all right? All right, so stick to the basics. And uh, stick to the basics. The majority views do not worry about minority views unless they quote a statute, unless they tell you there's some particular um, uh, some particular law that's involved, all right? Rule six, beware of terms of art. Beware of terms of art. Law, legal language, uses terms of art. So if I were to tell you that a uh, defendant had malice aforethought, that has nothing to do with hatred or ill will beforehand, all right? It's a legal meaning. And it's, it means the intent to kill or intent to do great bodily harm or the knowing creation of a high risk of death or that great bodily harm will occur. They love to test terminology. That's a legal test. So use the legal meaning, not the dictionary meaning. So when you see malice aforethought, don't think hatred beforehand. Think intent to kill, intent to do great bodily harm, or knowing the creation of a high risk where death or great bodily harm uh, would occur. Terminology is important on this examination. And terms of art occur throughout the seven subjects that are tested on multi-state. Rule seven. Do not become emotionally involved in the question. Do not become emotionally involved in the question. They have little Nora. Little Nora is hungry. She's starving. She goes to the grocery store. She reaches up with the intent to get a can of beans, and then the grocery uh, manager sees her. She puts it back. I'm sorry. Little Nora has just committed larceny. Larceny, the taking and aspiration of the uh, property of another with the intent to deprive permanently. That's larceny. Did she take the can? No. Did she have the intent to, ca uh, to take it? Yes. Can the grocery clerk or the store manager uh, uh, condone her actions? No, because a crime is an offense against the state. Therefore, we don't care about the victim that much, the grocery store. We care about the perpetrator, all right? So unlike in the real world, where the equities of a case may lead the court <coughs> excuse me, to reach a particular result, on Fantasy Island, the MBE, they like to use the equities to lead you down the primrose path to the wrong answer. Recent exam question. Actual, it's, a, it's an actual, um, uh, actual scenario. Guy sits at a bar. Let's, let's say his name's Macho Pig. All right? Sits at a bar. 
and another uh, customer grabs a barmaid and rapes the barmaid on the pool table. Macho Pig enjoys the view for whatever sick reason. Smokes a cigarette, drinks his beer, enjoys the view. He likes watching. He doesn't lift a finger to help the barmaid. What crime has Macho Pig committed? And the answer is none. None. So don't get mad at Macho Pig. Don't try and get him because he's a he's a a-hole. All right. The people in these questions aren't real. Nora, little Nora, isn't real. Even though she's a helper, she's a volunteer. Hey, she just tried to commit larceny. She did commit larceny. You can't take it back once all of the elements have been met. So if Macho Pig is just there, he does not say or do anything. He's not legally guilty of anything. Uh, so don't pick an answer that makes you feel good. Don't try to satisfy your sense of justice. The multi-state has nothing to do with justice. Pick the answer choice that's technically or legally correct. Say Macho Pig is not guilty and don't feel bad about letting him go. So don't get emotionally involved. Rule number eight, if you get an off-the-wall question, do not panic. All right? Off-the-wall question you don't know anything about, do not panic. All right? I just talked about the terminology sometimes that they've thrown into the exam, and the tort question that I referenced about uh, a negligence or strict liability issue. Off-the-wall question, the uh, answer choice was learned intermediary doctrine. Now, you could probably look higher or low in your bar review materials if you have any. You will not find learned intermediary doctrine. Well, what is that concept? It's a concept that absolves pharmaceutical companies from liability. If a pharmacist or a doctor uh, dispenses drugs that harms someone, generally, if a manufacturer uh, manufactures products that harm someone under strict liability, that manufacturer is going to be liable. All right? as long as some of these elements under Restatement 402A are met. I remember them with don't come crying to me because of the crummy product. Those are the elements. That is an acrostic that explains the elements of product liability. Don't come crying to me because of the crummy product. Don't, the D in don't, stands for a defect. A defect in the product. Come when it left the control of the seller. Control. Don't come crying. See, no changes in the product. No alterations. Don't come crying to me because, B, the seller was in the business of selling this kind of product. Um, or the manufacturer was in the business of manufacturing this kind of product. He's not a casual seller. So don't come crying to me because of the crummy, crummy causation. Causation. Both factual and legal causation. All right? Or proximate cause. Because the crummy product, P, privity. Privity. No privity is required for a strict liability claim under Restatement 402A. So don't come crying to me because of the crummy product is a checklist for you, and I've got lots of them, uh, a checklist for you to remember things, all right? To remember things under uh, testing conditions. So if you don't know anything about this question, and you've never heard of whatever they're talking about, don't panic. Apply uh, general principles, uh, general principles, all right? So if you get an example on bigamy, it says if the defendant is charged with bigamy, your first reaction is, geez, I didn't learn anything about bigamy on the bar exam. But don't panic. Nobody else knows uh, in the room either. All right? It's a distractor. 
designed to try and throw you off the track. So think general principles like mistake of fact or ignorance of law or accomplice liability. Don't worry. All right? Don't let them throw you off the track. Don't panic. Think general principles. Rule number nine, whatever you do, keep moving at a steady pace. Keep moving at a steady pace. This is what I call time management. The first thing I do, and I've done ever since my first multi-state bar exam, up to the last one, my 30th, I draw myself timelines. And I go to question number 18. And uh, after question 18, I put 30 minutes. Then I go to question number 36, I put one hour. Then I go to question uh, number 54, and I put one hour and a half, or one hour and 30 minutes. Why do I do that? Because as I'm taking the examination, I check to see at the 30 minute mark where I am. And if, let's say I'm slow, I mean for me it's not an issue, but for you it might be. If I'm slow, I speed up. If I'm on question 15, I should be on 18. Well, guess what? 16, 17, and 18 are going to be very easy for me because I'll mark them with C, C, and C, and I put a question mark next to them. Because if I use this time management technique, I'll have about 10 minutes remaining once I finish 100 questions. I can go back to the question marks and take an intelligent guess. But I don't feel sorry at all for people who come to me and saying, oh, I didn't finish the exam, I was about 20, you know, 20 questions short. That's not no excuse. If you use time management, whatever you do, keep moving at a steady pace. So don't get bogged down. Some of these questions have long fact patterns, some have short fact patterns, all right? So if you get a mental block or you don't understand the question, skip it. Uh, mark it, put a question mark next to it, and move on. Rule number 10, no drastic changes, no drastic changes once you start in your life, once you start studying for the bar exam, all right? So no drastic changes. Get rid of these distractions. If you're going to get a divorce, wait till after the bar exam, all right? If you're going to break up, wait till after the bar exam. No drastic changes. Some people, including me for my first bar exam, I started running, all right? Well, you know, I was cramping half of the time <laughs> from running. I mean, since then, I've run several marathons. Uh, it doesn't bother me anymore. But the point is, no drastic changes. Whatever got you here, keep doing the same thing. If you're a smoker, keep smoking. You know, don't try to quit. Nothing should interrupt the status quo. All right. Now, um, let me review these Gen 10 principles to you, and if you have any questions, obviously you can call me or go on our website or watch this video again. Uh, read carefully, number one. Number two, read the call of the question first, and then you read the fact pattern circling strange sounding facts, all right? Active reading. Number three, never look for the right answer. Always eliminate answer choices that cannot possibly be right. Number four, test each answer with factual, legal, and application accuracy. Factual first, if it's not factually correct, draw a line through it. Legally second, if it's not legally correct, draw a line through it. Application accuracy, if it doesn't answer the mail, doesn't answer the call of the question, draw a line through it, you're done with it. All right? Number five, stick to the basics. Stick to the basics. Apply majority rule. Number six, beware of terms of art. Beware of terms of art. And understand that some, um, uh, some terminology may apply to common law, some may apply to modern law. So keep an open mind by eliminating answer choices. Number seven, don't become emotionally involved in the question. Do not become emotionally involved. You don't care about these people. You don't care about little Nora. You don't care about Macho Pig. 
Number eight, if you get an off-the-wall question, do not panic. Think general principles. Number nine, keep moving at a steady pace. And number 10, status quo. Keep the status quo. Now briefly, let me tell you how I pick between two answer choices. Let's say it gets down to two answer choices, and it often does. You've eliminated two answer choices, now you're down two answer choices. You don't know which one to pick. Well, I have an acrostic for you that you should remember. Larry liked fried shrimp, perfectly cooked. Larry liked fried shrimp, perfectly cooked. <coughs> Larry, the L in Larry stands for, if you get an answer choice or two answer choices, one is steeped in law and the other one steeped in fact. Pick uh, the legal answer choice over the factual answer choice. After all, it's a legal exam. So Larry liked fried shrimp, perfectly cooked, law over fact. Liked, what does the second L stand for? Longer answer choices. If it comes down to two answer choices, and one is a more specific, a longer answer choice, pick it over the shorter one. Larry liked. Fried first in time. Chronologically first rule. What does that mean? That means pick an answer choice that has to happen before or consider what happens before something else can happen. In other words, you have to have a prima facie case before you even consider the defenses. You have to find the steps of the courthouse before you argue the merits of a case. So chronologically first rule or first in time. Larry liked fried. Shrimp, S, stay away. Stay away. What do you stay away from? Stay away from strange sounding facts, terminology you've never heard of before. Uh, a lot of cab drivers in the group will pick those answer choices. You know, the negative inferential theory. I don't know what it means. Do you know what it means? It sounds great, but it's never the right answer. So stay away from terminology you've never heard of, way, uh, heard of before. Stay away from absolutes. Stay away from an uh, answer choices that suggest never or always. That is not law. There's always another argument. So never or always or onlys are bad answer choices in general. And finally, um, stay away from Latin terminology. I have not seen a Latin answer to be correct on the bar exam in 30 years of studying the bar exam. So even our old friend, Ray Zipsa, locator, all right, answer choices in Latin invariably are the wrong answer choices. So stay away terminology you've never heard of before, stay away from absolutes, stay away from Latin terms. So Larry liked fried shrimp perfectly, perfectly. What does the P stand for? The P stands for um, play word association, play word association. If you're in torts and uh, they're testing you on negligence, um, well, then terminology that can only occur in uh, intentional torts is never the right answer. Um, so play word association. Understand the terminology that's associated with the subparts of each uh, subject. So uh, intentional torts, and they're trying to suggest to you that a person is too young to have committed an intentional tort is a wrong answer because there is no age restriction. In fact, you could be a congenital fool with a diploma proudly uh, behind your desk. Uh, you could still be liable for an intentional tort. Conversely, um, if it's a negligence question, 
you cannot um, you cannot uh, be liable for some analysis that suggests strict liability or intentional tort. So Larry like Fry Tramp perfectly, perfectly play word association, cooked, cooked, cooked. Check your modifiers. Check your modifiers in your answer choices. If, because, unless, or similar modifiers. If is the best of all possibilities. All right? Because it suggests that if the situation were as they painted on the answer choices, this could happen. Yeah. If I were handsome, I could date supermodels. All right? Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, but if is the best of all possibilities. Because is less, is more restrictive. It's the second best answer choice. And then finally, unless, unless, is the most restrictive. So if, because, unless. And in our course, we'll show you how to handle these modifiers and this terminology so you can back into the right answer often without really understanding uh, completely the law you've just chosen. Okay. So, um, in conclusion, uh, let me just conclude with uh, one caveat and a little war story. Um, what I've just told you, all of that is not going to help you unless you study with realistic question. Again, Susan Case, the former director of testing for the National Conference of Bar Examiners, the proponent of the exam, has written that most candidates who fail complain they've never seen these type of questions before in their bar review materials. Again, that's not going to happen. So you need a working knowledge of what's tested in each subject and particularly with examples and concepts that have been recently tested on a multi-state bar exam. So whatever you have to do, you got to make the time to study, but more importantly, what we do is we actually provide you diagnostic testing throughout to analyze your um, strengths and your weaknesses. Because the multi-state got to have an average score or above to pass it. So for studying, if it means taking time off from your job uh, or starting early. We started early as five months before the bar, uh, bar exam because, believe me, you've got to study smart, not hard. You've got to be able to focus on what you need to know for the bar exam and be able to pass the bar exam. All right? So a little bit of a war story. I mean, I've taken 30 multi-state bar exam. I can tell you lots of them. But uh, let me tell you about a war story. Uh, I was sitting in Guam, and uh, I had the flu, and I was sweating all over the paper. And um, this was on the on the essay part. And um, uh, the uh, the essay part, uh, they actually had a question on Guam law. I knew nothing about Guam law, but I was able to give them a lawyer-like answer and structure my answer in such a way that I was still able to pull out nine uh, of ten points on the essay. Or there's another story for multiple choice testing, uh, which I call the Nick Ivoroni story. Nick Ivoroni took the bar exam in Virginia, and he later became a dean of University of Virginia. Uh, I took my first bar exam in Virginia, and uh, this story was famous. Uh, Nick Ivoroni came to a multiple choice question, and uh, in Virginia, the men still have to wear suit and coat. Uh, the ladies have to be appropriately dressed. Uh, so you, it's a very, the Commonwealth is a very formal place to take the bar exam. So Nick came in his white linen suit, was all dressed up with a bow tie, and he came to take the multi-state bar exam, and he came to a question um, that he knew nothing about. Nick graduated from the top of his class. 
and it said, how many members are there on the Virginia Commerce Commission? So Nick uh, didn't even know there was a Virginia Commerce Commission, and um, it was a multiple choice question, so uh, you know he had to think quickly and, and think about this. And he, he said, well, you know, how many members are there in the Supreme Court? There are nine members on the Supreme Court. So it's got to be less than nine because no governor of Virginia would appoint more members to the Virginia Commerce Commission than nine. Then he asked himself, uh, how many members are there on the Virginia Supreme Court? Seven. He said, well, all right, seven. It's got to be less than seven because no member, uh, no governor of Virginia would ever appoint more members to the uh, Commerce Commission than there are members of the highest court in Virginia. He said, all right, um, what do I do now? So it's less than seven. Um, he says, oh, I know, it's got to be an odd number. All right, it's got to be an odd number. So it's got to be three or five. And um, he reasoned that uh, Virginia would try to, you know, employ as many lawyers as possible. So he chose five. Of course, the right answer was three. <laughs> but the point is, when you get a question that's off the wall like that, don't leave everything behind that you've learned in the past, do some analysis and think to yourself and uh, use some logic to answer these answer choices. So with that, I appreciate you watching. Uh, we hope we can help you. We've got complete online bar reviews for about $1,595 and then when you add tutoring, which has been the most successful for our candidates, you know, it's a little more than that, but our tutoring starts at about the same tuition as traditional bar reviews. And we want you to get an early start to get ready for the bar exam. So give us a call if you have any questions. Go on to readbarreview.com and register and avail yourself of some of the free um, materials there. But we wish you all of the success uh, in your bar exam efforts. Thank you.